Okay. Could you please start by saying and spelling your name? Uh, my name is Chase McCurry and spelled C H A I S M C C U R R Y. Okay. And today is Tuesday, June 26, 2018, and we are at Hall River Farmhouse Ales in Saxapaha, North Carolina. I am Richard Cox, talking today with Chase McCurry, head brewer as part of the Wellcrafted North Carolina project. So, start, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so, I am the head brewer here, started um, January of this year. Um, I've been here about three years. Um, I, at home, have a family of three boys. Um, that's pretty much it. Are they brewers? Uh, not yet. Um, they have home brewed with me quite a bit. So how, how did you get first um, interested in the brewing industry? Um, started, got interested, um, really started in college. The, I had a roommate that just went to the grocery store and saw a bunch of beer on the shelf and said, hey, let's try it all. So we started at that point and just going through everything um, on the shelf. Right. Um, after college, I got into home brewing. My wife bought me a home brew kit one year for either my birthday or Christmas, I can't remember what it was, um, and just started brewing um, and brewed pretty much every day, every, every chance, every open chance I got. Um, so I was doing that for about eight years before I got into professional. So how, about what year was that? Oh, that was probably 2005. Okay. And uh, so once you got into brewing, um, how long did it take you to get into the, uh, become a professional? Um, I was years. I was brewing around eight years before, yeah. doing home brewing for about eight years, and then um, really got super interested in getting into the professional side um, around, was that 2004? 14, okay. 2015, sometime in that range. So right about when things were escalating around yes. North Carolina. Yep. So good time. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was starting to jump off. Yeah, so how did you get started professionally? Um, so uh, at that point, we had just had our second child and my wife wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. So she decided to get out of her job as a computer programmer um, and I was doing landscaping lawn care and we both kind of wanted to change what we were doing. Right. Um, so we both quit our jobs um, and bought a, sold our house in Durham and bought an old farmhouse out in the country. Um, and at that point we decided we can do whatever we want. Um, so I went back to school, went to Wake Tech um, for the craft beer and brewing course there. Um, after that, uh, talked to Ben quite a bit and started down here. Cool, awesome. So, um, what resources have you drawn upon to help you grow as a brewer? Um, well, I mean, the, the Wake Tech thing was, was great. That's a great course over there to get you, um, get as much education as possible. Um, prior to that, I mean, I'd been brewing for eight years, so I'd listened to podcasts, read as many of the books as I could read, went over, you know, just as much learning as I could do in order to, to know as much as possible going into professional. So coming, moving on into Hall River, mm -hmm. um, how would you describe Hall River to people who are unaware of the brewery? Um, well, we're kind of, physically, we're kind of hidden down here in the basement of the Sax at the, um, the River Mill. Um, but for the most part, we're a, a, a Belgian style brewery um, using as many local and uh, farm grown ingredients as possible. Mm -hmm. And what would you say, based upon that, is the main mission or theme of Hall River? Basically, that is to use as much local ingredients and in as many of our friends in the you know the surrounding area. We're out here in the country, so we can use as many of the farmers as we want um, for the local ingredients and to explore and just be create be as creative as possible with any of the beers that we want to make. Right. Um, we have a lot of we we pair a lot of our beer with food, mm -hmm. so we use um, a good bit of thought whenever we start brewing a beer we come up with what we'd want to pair that with food wise and then we go from there and figure out our ingredients and who we can get it from who locally grows that and then start sourcing things and so since you're talking about pairing it with food do you do you think ahead about doing food pairings as a part of what you do here or is that not necessarily um, doing the actual food pairings we don't have a restaurant here right. um, but we do dinners um, and we pair that a lot with you know whenever we do a dinner up at the eddy or out in other places we definitely think about how our beers would pair with that and for the most part most of our beers just pair well with food anyway because right. we we think about that ahead of time exactly and that is the proximity to the farms and farmers one of the reasons that Saxon Paul was selected as the location? Yeah, um, so Ben, our owner, whenever he was, um, 
he was home brewing before he opened the brewery. Um, when he sold his previous business and decided to open the brewery, they were living in the apartments down the hill. Um, and Saks Bahav was just one of those um, places that they really liked a lot. Um, so they decided um, there was a, this was right when they were starting to renovate everything up here. Um, and they jumped in as quick as they could to start um, to get it open in the, in here. Yeah, and what's your space like in here? like? Um, so we have a 10 barrel premier system um, brew house uh, that we double brew on um, into 20 barrel tanks. Um, we have three 20 barrel fermenters, one 20 barrel bright, and then we have a two barrel stout uh, pilot system that we make just basically tap room only stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of two barrel fermenters and a two barrel bright. And you do bourbon barrel aging? We do barrel aging. We have a barrel warehouse where we keep our sours. Um, we have about 200 barrels right now um, and then we have two 25 barrel oak fooders. Oh great. So when as you mentioned before you were moving into well, the brewery was opening here in Saxon Hall what was the area like because you talked about there were some renovations that were starting here at the mill. Well there was a good bit going on at that point the the um, apartments had already been renovated the the ballroom was built out and the general store was open there um, and the, I think the, the school was already open at that point. Um, basically it was the, the coffee shop, the Eddie upstairs and us being kind of filled in those last few spots. Mm -hmm. um, Saxball is always a tiny town. Um, it's a little, what they call a nice little hamlet in the middle of the kind of the rural area. Right. Um, so we don't have a, a, a lot in Saxby Hall. There's basically the river mill and a couple other things across the road. Um, but the people who are here really make the place. Sure. And like you say, I mean, it gives you access to the farming, but it also puts you basically between the proper triad and triangles. Right. It's kind of right in the middle. Um, yeah. So we have, it's about 30 minutes to the triad and about 30 minutes to the triangle. So it's easy to get to us. A lot of people don't know where we are, but it's, it's fairly easy coming down 54 to get to us. Right. So, so while the, the opening was happening, do you know of any specific challenges that were faced um, in getting the brewery open? Um, I, I remember, so it was prior to my time actually starting here, but I remember seeing some of the pictures of, you know, digging out the trench drains, changing, like completely renovating the whole space because they had to cut out walls. Um, the window space here, if you see outside, there's a big slab um, that's about 24 inches thick that they just had to cut out of the wall and couldn't really do anything with. So there was a lot of construction issues with getting things in here. And I mean, we're in a small space, so even fitting all the tanks through the doors and getting all the stuff moved in was a, a challenge. Oh, I'm sure, right. Um, okay. Kickstarter, so Kickstarter was chosen as a market funding platform to raise funds and help create a more responsible, more sustainable brewery to quote mm -hmm. you all. So can you talk a little bit about the process and why you chose to go that route? Um, well, using Kickstarter at that point was a little bit fresher than it is now. So it was a good way to get the marketing out and to let everybody know that we were opening and to get a lot of people interested in what we were doing. Um, so doing that, we raised a good bit of funds that we put towards our solar tanks and our solar hot water heaters um, to be more sustainable. So we got solar panels on top of the roof that help heat either the floor glycol in the back of the production space or our hot water heaters so we can reclaim hot water from the brewing process and not have to use as much water. So it's interesting because you use Kickstarter not like it seems like a lot of other breweries do, which is to open your doors. Right. So the brewery was happening, it's just a matter of making yeah, we sustainable. right. We use we use those funds to to make it a little bit more um, environmentally friendly as we could. Right, and you also mentioned too that when you um, started the Kickstarter, that um, Kickstarter was a fresher idea. Right. So can you go a little bit more into that? And how well, I think there's since since that time. So that was about five years ago. So since that point, there's been a lot of breweries that have come along and used Kickstarter to open, which is great. But a lot of people have kind of started looking at that as well, you know, we don't really, why do you need us to open your brewery? Or there's been a few that I've actually heard about that got a lot of money and never did anything with it and never opened. So a lot of those things, those negative things from Kickstarter is why a lot of people don't really go into funding that anymore. So at that point, I think it was a lot of, a lot more of a, fre like I said, a fresher idea of somebody, you know, oh, I can help out this brewery that wants to open. That's great. Um, 
But at this point, I think a lot of people are starting to kind of not want to do that. Right. And you all had a different, like I said, a different approach as well. Right. So that's awesome. So um, when you first got to Hall River, come in, mm -hmm. what were your first impressions of the brewery? Um, well, I'm, I'm a stainless addict, so I love the space. <laughs> like it, just everything aesthetically pleasing, everything set up the way you would want a brewery set up. Um, you know, all the, all the, the bells and whistles were put into the brew house. It's one of the top of the line brew houses, the fermentation tanks, everything is pretty much the way you would want a space set up. Um, I think a lot of thought went into that before we ever opened. Um, ben, our owner, is a, a, a graphic designer, so he put a lot of mental thought into how the space should be set up, how it should look, how he wanted the feel of everything to flow. And I think you do a really good job on that. Great. And um, so how would you say Hall River reflects your brewing approach, interests, or philosophy? So it's, that's, that's kind of one of those funny things. Um, I'm a IPA drinker and IPA brewer prior to coming to Hall River. Um, we don't do a lot of IPAs, we have a few. Um, I've kind of implemented a few more hoppy things. Um, but for the most part, whenever I started, it was a lot of learning about Belgian beer. Um, I had brewed a few Saisons, a few you know, Belgian style beers, nothing, I wasn't overly interested in it. But whenever I got here, I started learning a lot more about traditional styles, traditional ways of brewing, you know, all the methods, um, especially with sours, like how to how to go about making, you know, barrel aged beers, um, what yeast to use and all that stuff. So it was really whenever I got here, learn as much as possible about Belgian styles. Um, prior to that, like I said, I was I was making IPAs all day long. And all, you know, that was what I was brewing all the time. How much of a learning curve you say it was for you? Um, well, it was kind of a short learning curve. So whenever I started, uh, I started in the, as an assistant brewer, I was doing a lot of keg washing, you know, learning everything in the back on the seller side. Um, and then our head brewer at the time, Nathan, about eight months after I started, decided to move on. He lived in Raleigh. It was a bit of a drive for him to get out here. Um, so he wanted to move a little bit closer. Um, so whenever he moved on, there was about a month period bef between him leaving and us finding a new head brewer. Um, so I was kind of thrown into uh, the fire, as you would say, and started brewing on the big system, pretty much learning that system in about two and a half, three weeks. So it was, a, it was quite an adventure at that point. Um, so, I, I mean, my learning curve was kind of steep. I, I got there as quick as I could, mm -hmm. um, but every day is a, a new learning. Like every day there's a new process. Every day there's a new ingredient. Every day there's a new something to figure out and figure out how to make it work. Yeah, and um, so how, sort of playing off that, how would you describe your average week? Because I know it's bringing so much more of a process that right. the average day is yeah so so our weeks are typically set up about one to two brew days um we double brew so it's me and my sister rebecca um i'll usually do the first shift because i get kids and it's a little bit harder for me to get um to be here late um so i'll do the first shift i'll come in and start the brew around eight nine um and then she will come in around one or two and finish out through the night and do the clean um so we'll brew one or two times a week. Typically outside of that, there's a lot of cellar work, there's a lot of packaging. Um, prior to um, about three or four months ago, we were doing all hand bottling um, through our bottling line, which just takes a lot of time. Um, so we recently started canning our beer using Tap Hopper out of Greensboro. Mm -hmm. um, and with those guys, it goes much quicker. So it opened up a lot more time for focusing on getting our cellar straight, um, making sure we're cleaning a little bit, you know, keeping everything as clean as possible. Um, doing stuff like that. Um, outside of that, we do a lot of fruit processing. Like last week we were processing watermelons, which took all day of one of those days of the week. Um, we do a lot of juicing fruits to use in, you know, the finish of beers and stuff like that. Um, so there's, there's a good bit of fruit processing that goes on with us too. Mm -hmm. So how, so all river ales have been described as quote, uh, traditional with a little Southern flair. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? Well, I think the Southern flair is using the local ingredients as much as we can. So using the Southern grown, um, like there are our pills that we have on draft right now, we use corn that was grown about five miles from us. Um, the uh, watermelons that we processed last week were North Carolina grown watermelons. The cucumbers that we're gonna get towards the end of this week that's going into a pickle beer, North Carolina ingredients. So using as much Southern stuff with the traditional style. So all the styles that we brew are 
for the most part, traditional Belgian style beers. Mm -hmm. um, we just add the Southern ingredients to kind of bring them to, to where we want them to be as Hall River. So tell me about this pickle beer. <laughs> so we, um, every year, uh, not every year, probably the past three years, there's been a pickle fest in downtown Durham. They do it at the Rick House. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we had made a pickle beer before. We had made a collaboration with Steel Stream called you know, Pickle Mania. They still make it over there. Um, so we decided we wanted to make a pickle beer for the pickle fest. So for the past two years, we've been doing it on the two barrel system and just making a small batch and sending it over there. It's a um, pickle, it's a, it's a Saison. This year we've, we've, it was a Saison with pickling spices and cucumbers and dill, um, all the traditional pickle stuff. Um, this year we're doing it as our Cultural Divide series, um, which is a yogurt kettle soured um, Saison um, that we're adding cucumbers and pickling spices and dill to the finish of. So it's gonna be a little bit tart, so it's got a little bit of that, we're calling it farm stand pickle, so it's more of like something you would get at a farmer's market versus like something you would buy off the store shelf. So, and, and pulling into a lot of the things you've been saying so far, um, what do you see as unique about Southern beer and specifically North Carolina beer? Um, well, North Carolina beer is growing to the point of being kind of every, like there's a lot of different places doing a lot of different styles. There's Red Oak doing their, their lagers and Mason Jar Lager Company doing lagers. Um, there's a lot of people doing the um, New England styles right now. Like it is, it is a little bit of a run the gamut um, for North Carolina beers. Um, specifically as Southern beers, I think Southern beer, like with what full, we do, Full Steam does, Fauna Flora, we, we go out and find the, the forge for the ingredients that we want to go into the beers. And I think that, that that's what brings the Southern aspect into it, is trying to make it as local and as personable as possible. All right. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the Farmhand Exchange and what that is? Um, so the Farmhand Exchange is a, a program that we started doing before we opened, um, was essentially we, we get um, an ingredient that we want to use in a beer. Um, and we, we put it on social media, we let people know that we have the packs of seeds mm -hmm. for people to come in and grab the packs of seeds. So we do it early in the season. Um, we ask people to take the seeds that we're gonna give them and grow the ingredients. So they grow, we've asked for gooseberries, white strawberries, there's been a few other things, I can't remember them all. Um, and we just say, hey, grow what you wanna grow, what you can grow, bring us those ingredients um, whenever they get ripe and we'll put them in a beer. Um, so we try to get, you know, we, we want people to, to go out and grow our ingredients for us. We want to be, you know, as, as friendly as possible about it, but um, it's, a, it's a way of interacting with our consumer and saying, you know, they can have a little bit of ownership over the beer. Hey, I grew that ingredient that they put into this beer that I'm drinking across the bar. Mm -hmm been successful as a part of the amount you get back of the gooseberries for example uh, <laughs> success is rated different ways sure. Um, well, sure. so we don't get a lot of fruit back I mean there's been a few times I know I've grown as much as I can grow but there's been a few times that even with trying to grow it at my house they just didn't take right. um, so it's we get as much as we can get back it's not something we get a ton of um, and if we don't get a lot of it we have other sources for those ingredients some other farmers that are already growing them and then we use we kind of supplement with the uh the stuff that we get from the home home grown people and this may be a difficult question but in a fruit beer about how many pounds of fruit as an average would it really depends yeah. on the fruit um so with the watermelons that we did last week we did um we got a thousand pounds of watermelons we used about 350 pounds in citra melon the rinds we used um, in Pound of Flesh for one of our sour beers, we got about 350 pounds out of that. Um, with the blueberries prior to that that we're doing in Java Berry, we did 200 pounds in the kettle and then another 300 pounds in the finish. So about 500 pounds of blueberries went into that beer. It's really a variation on how, how much flavor you can get out of certain ingredients. And we kind of keep track of that on each time we use it. So we know for the next time we brew it, how much we're gonna put into that. So, and we've talked about local ingredients a lot so far. So what would you say um, are some of the benefits of locally sourcing your ingredients? And how do you feel they impact the flavor of the beer as opposed to perhaps importing it from somewhere else? Well, it's, it's all about your local community. It's about growing, you know, using the resources that you have close to you without, so you're not impacting 
um, and having to, to buy stuff out of market. Like we could go down to Florida and get as many citrus fruits as we want, or we could go, you know, up to Virginia and get all the cherries we want. Like, it's just, it's a matter of wanting to keep it all as, as local as possible, which keeps the money in the community, keeps our farmers happy, keeps them producing so that, you know, local agriculture is something that, that needs to be sustained and is we're just trying to do our part to keep it going. Great. And so, slide to the side a little bit. How do you see Hall River growing in the future? Um, I think we're going to be looking at um, expanding within you know a, a short amount of time, um, adding some extra tanks to get some more production in, um, continuing with our cans, um, get a, get more stuff in cans to get more stuff in front of the consumer. Um, I think with the, as far as the space here, I think we want to get a little bit more seating as much as we can get we're we're in a tiny little space so it's hard to get a lot more people in here but trying to get as many people in here as we can um and then our growth for the future is just you know trying to be more productive right great so expanding our scope here a little bit so how would what would you say it's like to work in the craft brewing industry today of course you started in 2014 there's actually been a, actually there's been a lot that's happened there's that been a lot that's happened in that amount of time um Today, I think versus at that point, um, I think it was more focused on um, putting beer out to um, like bottle shops and grocery stores and trying to get shelf space and doing that. I think the shift has come when a lot of the breweries realize we're making a lot more money off our tasting rooms and trying to drive a lot more traffic through your own personal space. And yeah, I just heard this week Highwire is opening a second location in Durham. So it's a lot about um, trying to get your own um, name, your own building, your own um, tasting rooms in different markets so that you're not having to put as much stuff on shelves and you're trying to bring the consumer into you versus putting things in front of the consumer. And I would just say the, it's a similar question, I would just say the brewing scene has changed since. Uh, well, I mean, the, the New England IPAs have kind of taken over the world. Right. Um, so there's a lot of um, those kind of things, like it's just the trend. So as a brewer, you have to be able to, to move along with the trends that are coming. If you get stuck in one space, then you kind of get left behind. Right people will come back to you, but it's not, you're not pushing the market. You're not driving um, where you need to go. So a lot of stuff is um, the trends are kind of driving the market and where breweries are going. Um, New England IPAs, obviously now they're coming, like there's, there's more stuff on the horizon that's coming up that a lot of breweries are going to be chasing. Um, so I feel like with Hall River, we have our traditional beers. We have our, our everyday lineup that, you know, our new ones, our St. Ben's, they're all progressive style beers but um, we also are capable of doing the trendy thing and getting some of those beers out and, and maintaining our, our, our market share, I guess, our, our maintaining our face in front of people. Great. And um, so what role do you feel Hall River has played in any changes in Saxophone Hall? As I mean, it's... It's hard to say because um, everybody here is such a community that it's hard to say we've we've affected anything like super you know, like we are the reason for it. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we've kind of expanded more people coming to Zach's Ball. I, I feel like the Eddy has really drawn a lot of people in. The ballroom's drawn a lot of people in. I, I hope that we have drawn some people in. Um, and when you get more people coming down, it's a lot more people that realize, oh, this is a great little community. We got a river we can go kayaking down. We got the Saturdays and Sacks that we can go do. So it's just, I feel like we've we've helped everyone in the community with trying to draw more people out to Sacks Ball. And where do you see the brewing industry going in the next five years? Because we we're just talking about New England IPAs being the current. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I, what I'm, I'm seeing from a lot of craft breweries is a lot more lagers. Um, so I'm hoping that that's kind of a trend that's coming on is a lot more, um, a lot more craft breweries using local ingredients, using the, the better ingredients to make some nice clean lagers. Um, but also, you know, IPAs are not going away. IPAs are going to drive the market all the way, always. So I think the, the next trendy thing that I've seen coming up for uh, IPAs is the Brute IPA, which is like a champagne-like IPA that's nice and dry and crisp, but a ton of hop flavor and aroma. Um, so those are the two that I've kind of been watching and how they're going. 
So what would you say is your favorite beer or style, I suppose, from a North Carolina brewery other than Hall River? So I don't do favorites very well. I like to try as much of everything as I can. Uh -huh. um, so I drink a lot of North Carolina beer. Right now I've been drinking a lot of Sycamore, their Mountain Candy IPA. Mm -hmm. um, I love Burial's stuff, Burial Surf Wax, their, their IPA that they have in cans. That one's delicious. Um, and really I just, I, I do a lot of exploring whenever I'm drinking outside of Hall River. So sure. I, I try as many different Hall, um, North Carolina beers as I can. Great. And what would you say is Hall River's flagship or signature beer? That would definitely have to be um, Newland's original Belgian Pale Ale. Um, so that one, that's been our best seller probably since day one. Um, it's a, a nice, dry, crisp Belgian Pale Ale dry hop with Galaxy, which is this nice, fruity, um, uh, New Zealand hop. It's it's really delicious. Awesome, amazing. Um, so, what would you say is your favorite beer from Hall River? My favorite beer is one of the beers we actually currently have in the lineup. Our Sun Hands is our Belgian Golden Strong, okay. our double dry hop Belgian Golden Strong. Like I said, I'm a hop head, so I, I try to get the hoppy beers as I can. Um, but it's a 10% Golden Strong um, that we brew once, at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, depending. Um, and this year is the first year we put it in cans, so it's been my, my go-to for a while. Great. That's all I have. Cool. Is there anything you like to add? Not that I can think of. Thank you very much. Yeah, man.